Hi, and welcome everyone. This is J.P. Olson with Journey into the Word and um, over in Ireland. And I made sure that you all would have a message for today. I said I would be here. So I'm happy that you're here, that you're here joining me. And God just bless you. We just bless you with love and happiness. I'm just going to let this song play just a little bit. We just want to jump right in here. And as we go through this every Saturday, there may be some new people on. And we welcome you to the family. We are journeying to the word, non-denominational evangelistic ministry. And we are a family. We come together as a family. We're not biologically related, but we might, we might as well be. Because we're from the family of Jesus Christ. And we are followers of Jesus Christ. And so... Today, we just want to just let you know, if you're here for the first time, we don't want you just to come once and leave. We want you to stay connected with us, and we have ways to do that. You go to our YouTube and sign up, subscribe. Our website, go and see what our ministry is doing, uh, our missions, everything that we're doing. And then we have Pinterest, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and the music you hear is my own personal music. And you can download track from Amazon, iTunes, or get the CD from the website. Also, we have our Monday uh, inspirational readings to help you get through the week to sustain you. Go there and sign up the form so you can receive that every Monday. We have a large database that goes out to Tuesday night is our Tuesday night Bible study with Dr. Kenneth Adderley at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. I'm telling you, Dr. Adderley goes down. He goes deep into the word of God. He's a theologian and he really teaches us the word of God, a believer. And so we want you to join us if you can for our Tuesday night Bible study. And then we're back here on Wednesday for my just passing through words of encouragement at 1 o'clock p.m. That's Chicago time, Central Standard Time. So we want you just to stay connected with us. We have our blog. We have our, if you have a prayer request, we love to pray. I love to pray. And if you go to the website and complete the form, the intercessors will come together in their prayer time on Monday and pray over these and stand in the gap and intercede. And I'll pray over them on Sunday, again on Monday. And we stand in the gap and we intercede. And to our Father, who is our intercessor, to the Father. And so send in your prayer request. We love to pray. And then I think I have, um, I think I've covered everything. I'm not sure. We got our Wednesdays, our Bible study, our inspiration readings, uh, our blog, our, our, our prayer request, and then giving. Giving. I pray that you have a heart to give. And I think I am so grateful. I'm overwhelmed with the outpouring of gifts and, 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 and contributions that God has touched each of you who are supporters of this ministry that we can take care of our needs. I am so grateful. And I said, Lord, we just have a few more missions that we're trying to complete. And those who haven't given at all and just wonder how, what is, it, how, what is this, thing, this giving thing about? Trust God. Trust Him. Pray that He touch your heart to release what's in your hands. And to the ministry, I I can promise you that all of his promises are yes. And God will bless you. He said, test me. He said this in his word in Malachi. You test me. You give and you test me. You test me. And I will open up the doors of heaven that you cannot receive. So if you haven't started sowing into the ministry, I ask you today to pray about it. And, and ask God to touch your heart. And become a regular partner like I have on here. They partner every month, some every week. They're on here and they help our ministry to sustain. I don't like to use the word promote. But we have to promote our ministry. We have to pay for advertisement even here. Just, for, you know, so we can be on. People can come. But we have a need. And we, and we go out and we help and we serve. And we are servants. So that's all I'm going to say for giving. We gave the communion last week. So many people are doing it today because it's Resurrection Saturday for us. And tomorrow, many will be celebrating Resurrection Day, Resurrection Sunday. And so we are here today to just, I'm here to break the bread with you of the word of God. Okay, the word, we're going to be spiritually fed. I want you, if you're enjoying this message, please share it with someone else. Invite someone else. Don't keep it all to yourself. And so, so we're going to jump right into the message now because I want to get the word of God and, and just feed you this morning. So welcome, family. And Jodine will have the comments here, the scriptures, everything will be here for you. Welcome, family. Come to the table so that we can partake of the word of God. The spiritual meal is being served. The table is spread. And what does JP also always say? And there's a feast going on over here. But Lord God, I give you thanks today. For you are good and your mercy is endless. And here we stand, Lord, at the start of this holy week. This week in which your church remembers Jesus. Passion and death. 
Today we will talk about the crucifixion and the resurrection. And we are distracted by many things. Turn our eyes now, Lord, to the one who comes in your name. The one who opens the gate of righteousness. The one who answers when we call. Yes, Lord. We want to thank you. Here we are today. Resurrection Day, I call it. The crucifixion of Jesus is recorded in the New Testament books. And I want you to stay in here and hang in here with me. Because I got some things I want to share with you today. We're here today. Whether I'm in Ireland, whether you in Wisconsin, whether you're of Ohio, New York, and, 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 and Haiti, and Africa, and Canada, and Massachusetts, and Wisconsin, and Tennessee, and all the places you are. The various countries. Pakistan, and India, and... Wherever you are, we're celebrating the resurrection. You see, the crucifixion of Jesus recorded in the New Testament books known as the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Bible story is the central summary of the saving gospel of Jesus. Jesus had prophesied of his death in Matthew. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed. And on the third day, he would raise again. He would be raised to life. Jesus understood that his life would be required as a sacrifice for the sins of you and I and the sins of man at the height of his ministry and miracles. Many Jews came to believe in Jesus as Messiah, the son of God, Jewish leaders feared Jesus because of his growing followers. With the help of Judas Iscariot, Roman soldiers arrested Jesus and he was put on trial for claiming to be the king of the Jews. According to Roman law, the punishment for rebellion against the king was death by crucifixion. And some of y'all say, well, yeah, we've heard the story, but I got more. I always have more. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate was reluctant when it came to the punishment for Jesus. Pilate could find no wrong in him. Yet he wanted to give the people what they wanted. Isn't that something how we buckle under pressure? We know it's not right, but people pressuring us. And what did they want? That was the death of Jesus. Pilate washed his hands in front of the crowd to symbolize that he was not taking responsibility for the bloodshed of Jesus. And then handed Jesus over to be beaten and lashed. Jesus had a crown of thorns thrust on his head and made to carry his cross along the pathway to the hill where he would be crucified. The location of Jesus' crucifixion is known as Calvary, which is translated from a place of skull. Crowds had gathered to mourn and watch Jesus' death. Jesus was nailed to the cross between two criminals and his sides pierced by a sword. While Jesus was mocked, one of the criminals asked Jesus to remember him, and Jesus responded, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus then looked to heaven and asked God, Forgive them for they know not what they do. When taking his last breath, Jesus spoke, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit, it is finished. Extraordinary events mark the death of Jesus. Let's just picture this. The sky was completely dark for three hours as Jesus hung on the cross. At the moment of his last breath, the earth shook. The temple curtain split from top to bottom and the tombs of saints opened and the bodies raised from the dead. The crucifixion of Jesus was a part of God's plan from the very beginning of the birth of Jesus. He knew the assignment. The sin of mankind will require sacrifice. The sinless life of Jesus was lived and given so that man could receive salvation and eternal life in heaven. And just picture this. It has been a long day. Jerusalem is packed with Passover guests, most of whom clamor for a glimpse of the teacher. The disciples enter the room one by one and take their places around the table. After a few moments, Jesus stands and removes his outer garment. He wraps the servant's girdle around his waist, takes up the basin, and kneels before one of the disciples. He unlaces a sandal and gently lifts the foot, places it in the basin, covers it with water, and begins to, ba to bathe it. One grimy foot after another, Jesus works his way down the road. In Jesus' day, the washing of feet was a task reserved not just for servants, but for the lowest of servants. In this case, the one with the towel and basin is the king of the universe. Hands that shape the stars now wash away filth. 
fingers that form mountains now massage toes. And the one before whom all nations will one day kneel, now kneels before his disciples. You can be sure Jesus needs to, he knows the future of these feet that he is washing. These feet will dash for cover at the flash of a Roman sword. Only one, fair, one pair of feet won't abandon him in the garden. Judas will abandon Jesus that very night at the table. What a passionate moment when Jesus silently lifts the feet of his betrayer and washes them in the basin. Jesus knows what these men are about to do. By morning, they will bury their heads in shame and look down at their feet in disgust. And when they do, he wants them to remember how his knees knelt before them. Glory to God. And how he washed their feet. I just want you to picture that. He forgave their sin before they even committed it. He offered mercy before they even sought it. Oh, king of the universe. I'd like to think that I would have washed your feet and done better than the other disciples. But I know that's not true. Thank you for loving me and washing my feet and offering me mercy when I deserve none. Jesus is hard. Let me tell you something. It was a hard life for him on earth. Justice is hard to come by in this world. Courts do make mistakes. And sometimes innocent people suffer for crimes they do not commit. That's what happened to Jesus when he was crucified 2,000 plus years ago. Though he had done no wrong, uttered no threats, committed no crime, and had hurt no one, the powers that be described or decided that he had to die. So they trumped up charges against him, just shuffled him from one hearing to another, and in the end, they got what they wanted. Sometimes courts make mistakes. He died a criminal's death, hanging between two thieves, but he didn't deserve to be there. When Isaiah considers the death of the servant of the Lord, he stresses how Christ responded to unjust accusations. How no one came to his aid. No one came to his rescue, we would say, to his aid. And how, his, how even his burial testified to the wrong way he was treated. This passage ought to drive us to our knees in gratitude to Jesus for what he endured for our salvation. Let's begin by considering Jesus did, what Jesus didn't do and what he didn't say when he stood before his accusers. There was his submissive silence. His submissive silence. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Isaiah 53 verse 7. Sometimes you're known by what you don't say. In this case, Isaiah prophesied that Christ would not open his mouth to defend himself. Even in the face of certain death. Hundreds of years later that came true when he stood in the front of his accusers. And here are some verses. But Jesus kept silent. Matthew 26, 6, 63. He did not answer. Matthew 27, 12. But he kept silent and did not answer. Mark 14, 61. But Jesus made no further answer. Mark 15 and 5. But he answered him nothing. Luke 3, 23, 9. But Jesus gave him no answer. John 19 and 9. Sometimes you are known by what you don't say. When Jesus stood before Pilate and Caiaphas, he would not defend himself. He did not try to explain himself. In the case of Caiaphas, his mind was already made up. Pilate's situation was different because he was confused about Jesus' true identity. He did not have a bias against him. But even with Pilate, Jesus would only speak in order to force him to make a decision not to enter him into a debate with him. Pilate had to decide what to do with Jesus. In that sense, he stands for all of us. Let me just put it like this. See, Pilate had to make a decision about what to do with Jesus. In that sense, he stands for all of us. Once Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent, he should have let him go. But he didn't. Don't we see that in the justice system? Injustice. We can speculate about Pilate's motives for hours. But in the end, he could not wash his hands of the gift of Jesus' blood. Jesus spoke to him only to help him come to a decision. Once he knew the truth that Jesus was innocent, the Lord had nothing more to say to him. Pilate stands for all of us. When Peter wrote to the beleaguered, the beleaguered and scattered persecuted Christians in the first century, 
He used this passage as an example for how to respond when you're attacked by your faith or attacked for your faith. For this, for to this, you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. The greatest honor is to be like Jesus. According to Peter, following Jesus means that sometimes we will suffer even when we have done nothing wrong. The greatest honor for any Christian is to be like Jesus. When we suffer unjustly, we share in a tiny portion of what happened to him. Though he did no wrong, he was betrayed and tried and denied and crucified. Though he never sinned, he was hated by the power brokers who plotted to kill him. Kill him. The same thing will happen to us. People close to us will disappoint us. And some will turn against us. And how will we respond? Peter points to Jesus and says he did not retaliate. When we are insulted, our natural inclination is to return and insult for an insult. But Jesus chose a better way. As the old spiritual puts it, he never said a mumbling word. When he stood before Pilate and Herod, and when he faced the jeering mob, he uttered no insults. He made no threats. When they squouted, when they scourged him, he didn't retaliate. When the soldiers put the crown of thorns on his head, he didn't curse at them. When they drove the nails in his hands and feet, he didn't threaten them. When the bystanders spat at him, he didn't speak, spit back. When they swore at him, he didn't swear back. You find out what you really believe when others mistreat you. You find out what, you, what the reality is. You find out all these things that come against you. You find out what you really believe when others mistreat you. I'm going to say that again. You find out what you really believe when others mistreat you. Sometimes the real test of your faith is what you don't do. Sometimes you'd be a better Christian by not saying anything at all. For you are mistreated, repeat these four sentences. It's not about me. It's not about now. It's all about God. It's all about eternity. Was Jesus, was Jesus a victim? He was truly the silent savior, having all powers in his hand, decided not to use it against those who tormented him. According to Martin Luther King Jr., we must say to our enemies, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. That's the exact spirit of Isaiah 53 and 1 Peter 2 and 11. This was an unjust sentence. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Isaiah 53 and 8. Who protested the death of Christ? We always see these protesters out here protesting against, against something. Who spoke out against this miscarriage of justice? Who came to his defense? The answer is no one. Of all the major personalities involved in the death of Christ, ironically, it was Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, who showed the most concern for Christ. Unlike his trial before Caiaphas when he would not defend himself, Jesus engaged in a dialogue with Pilate because the governor seems uh, on one level to have been seeking the truth. At least he came to the right conclusion. Three times he said, I find no guilt in him. In the end, he caved to pressure and sentenced Jesus to death. His guilt is therefore all the greater because he knew what he was doing. He would rather die than hate you. No one spoke up, spoke up for Jesus because no one could speak up. The Jewish leaders were so enraged with Jesus, they were determined to kill him. They just fueled by fear and jealousy over a Galilean rabbi they could not control and did not understand. They paid off Judas, arrested Jesus at night, and put him through six hearings before morning, and then stood by as the Romans put him to death. He was cut off, Isaiah says. He died before his time. He was only a young man in his early 30s when he died. No one spoke up for Jesus. No one spoke up for him. That breaks my heart. That breaks your heart. When a, when a man dies young, we think of all, the, all he might have accomplished, the songs that may have been composed, the books that might have been written, 
and amazing discoveries that may have been that might have been made. He may have won. A, he might have won a Nobel Prize when we think about the young men that died young. She might have been our first female president. He might have won an Oscar. She might have been a superstar. And on goes the sad speculation about what might have been. That may be our worst fear that we will die before our time. We die too young or we die too soon or die or we die with our work unfinished or we die with our dreams unfulfilled. You can't say that about Jesus. What else did he have left to accomplish? He was put to death for the transgressions of his own people. Jesus finished all he came to do. Only one person in history never left behind any unfinished business. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the only person who could come to the end of his life and say, with absolute and total truthfulness, I have finished everything I set out to do. Just before Jesus died, he cried out, it is finished in John 19 and 30. Note that he did not say, I am finished, for that would have simply uh, implied that he died defeated. Rather, he cried out, it is finished, meaning I successfully completed the work I came to do. It is the Savior's cry of victory. Since Jesus Christ paid in full the price for our sins, the work of salvation is now complete. That's what we mean when we talk about the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's not just a slogan. It's a profound spiritual truth. What Jesus accomplished in his death was so awesome, so total, so complete, that it could never be repeated, not even by Jesus himself. His work is finished. There's nothing more God could do to save the human race. There's no plan B. Plan A, the death of Christ was good enough. His humble grace and his humble grave. Let's look at the humble grave as I dig deeper here. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. How could this be? How could Jesus be assigned a grave with the wicked and yet also with the rich in his death. The work of salvation is now complete. When Isaiah wrote these words, he no doubt must have wondered about, his, about himself. He must have wondered about this himself. The wicked and the rich generally end up in different places. A truly wicked person might be buried in an unmarked grave or in some obscure corner of a cemetery. We bury the wicked with dishonor and with a little fanfare as possible. But the rich, we honor with monuments and flowers and generous inscriptions. We make sure that 100 years from now, passerbys will know that an important man is buried here. We forget the wicked and remember the rich. That's how the world works. So how could Jesus be counted bo both with the wicked and with the rich in his burial? R.T. Kendall said it like this. Why Jesus died in his book, page 151 and 152. It points out that Jesus fulfilled this prophecy three ways. First, when Barabbas, a, gem, a genuine criminal, was set free, and Jesus quite literally died in his place. Second, when he died along the two criminals who also crucified the day at Calvary. And third, when he died for sinners everywhere, by taking their iniquity upon himself. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In verse 6, Romans 5 and 8, it tells us that Christ died for sinners. And Romans 4 and 5 even says that God justifies the wicked. Though he lived a sinless life, Jesus died for sinners and thus was assigned a grave with the wicked. Christ died a sinner's death, though he himself was sinless. But where was he buried? In a tomb borrowed from a rich man. Joseph of Arimathea, Matthew 27, 57 through 60. Thus, even the burial of Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy to the letter. Even though no one could have, been, could have foreseen it in advance, both the nature of his death by crucifixion and the place of his burial, a rich man's home, fulfilled prophecy given 700 years earlier. All of this happened even though Jesus was innocent. He had done no violence. He committed no sin. He told no lies. The only righteous man. It's hard for us to grasp how amazing this is because we have nothing to compare it to. That is, we don't easily, we don't exactly know what being sinless is because all of us are sinners. He was pure and holy and perfect in every way. He never sinned, 
Not even one time. Though he was severely tempted, he never gave in. All the rest of us fall so far short that we cannot begin to be compared to him. He is the only righteous man ever to walk this earth and we crucified him. His reward for doing God's will was a bloody Roman cross. Here's the wonder of grace at work. From the murder of a perfect man came God's plan to rescue the human race. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Out of the worst evil, God brought forth the greatest good. Only God could have done it. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and 8. Note the little word still. We were still sinners when Christ died for us. He didn't die for us while we were still church members or good people or law-abiding citizens or nice neighbors or high achievers. But he died for us while we were still lost in our sin and far away from God. Isn't that amazing? Such amazing grace. That's the truth about all of us. Christ died for sinners because it is only sinners that can be saved. For sinners only. How do we encounter the benefits of Christ's death? Reach out with the empty hands of faith and trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior. The door to heaven is marked for sinners only. If you are a sinner, you can come in. No one else need to apply. Christ died so that sinners like you and me could be saved. Here is God's call to us today. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Isaiah 1 and 18. And here's God's promise to those who come by faith. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. Are you a sinner? If so, there, here's some good news for you. What we could do, what we could not do for ourselves... God has done it for us through the death of his son. The only thing left is to believe in him. Turn from your sin, lay down your self-will and lay hold of the son of God who loves you and died for you. Cast yourself completely on Jesus for your salvation. If you trust in him with all your heart, he will not turn you away. This is the promise of God to all who believe in Jesus. God helped you to trust in him. At the beginning of the message, I said that this passage ought to drive us to our knees in gratitude to Jesus for what he endured for us when he died on the cross. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, mighty and impenetrable to temptation, a very present and well-proved help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change and though the mountains be shaken into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble let it swelling and tumult, think, Think about that, that there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the highest. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her right early at the dawn of the morning. The nations raged, the kingdoms tottered and were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, our fortress and high tower. Come behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations and wonders in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow into pieces and snaps the spear in two. He burns the chariots in fire. Be still and know, he said, recognize and understand that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, our high tower and stronghold. That's in the Amplified Bible. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Luke 23, 46. Lesson here. This is a lesson. Release it to God. Some of the issues we struggle with seem to be never ending. Like money worries and family problems and health concerns. Even when we get a break. And should be resting. We sit up anticipating the worst. Wondering how long Lord. Well the only way to have real peace is to commit the outcome to God. When Jesus cried father into your hands I commit my spirit. It was a cry of release. It was an act of trust that meant surrendering control to the father. Something we've yet to learn to do. The atoning blood had been shed. Salvation's work was finally complete. But before Jesus could pray that prayer, he first had to pray, Father, if you are willing, 
take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. In Luke 22, 42. And that's a prayer we must each learn to pray. In Philippians 3, 10, 11, Paul wrote, All I want is to know Christ and the power that raised him to life. I want to suffer and die as he did. So that somehow I also may be raised to life. We all want to rule and reign with Christ someday. We just don't want to submit our will to his today. But it doesn't work like that. Jack Half Hayford wrote, The charted course always has been the way of the cross. The cross not only calls us to Jesus, but it also calls us to a life. To the wisdom of God's ways in our relationship and pursuits. To the pattern of Jesus. We all have a cross to carry. Release it to God. Release it to God. You have to understand in the face of our deep, deepest struggles, whatever you're wrestling with today, I'm saying again, the cross not only calls us to Jesus, but it also calls us to a life, to the wisdom of God's ways in our relationship and pursuits, to the pattern of Jesus in the face of our deepest struggles. So whatever you're wrestling with today, Release it to God and for all, one and for all. When you do, you'll experience his peace and you won't be disappointed with the outcome. John 3, 18 said, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus is crying out to you today. Jesus lives. Jesus reigns. Crying out to Jesus is a battlefield of the mind, is a sensitive place. It is where Satan does his best work. When we can't help ourselves and call for help, when we push beyond our limits, when we pull it out of our comfort zone, when we don't like where we are and what we want and we want out of it, when we don't like who we are and we want to change, we reflectively and involuntarily resort to prayer. Help, Lord, is our natural cry. Prayer begins in trouble and it continues because we're always in trouble at some level. Finances, family, health, and on and on are required. It requires no special preparation, no precise vocabulary, and no appropriate posture. It springs from us in the face of necessity and in time becomes our habitual response to every issue, good and bad, we face in life. His help is only a prayer way in Philippians 4 and 6. A powerful and yet a simple prayer to pray is, I trust you, Lord. That simple little prayer can give you so much comfort. When you pray the promises instead of the problems, not only will it change your attitude from a victim to a victor, but also Jesus' word coming out of your mouth is powerful. When he hears his word coming out of you, he dispatches angels with the answers. He set miracles into motion and he will begin to change things. It may not happen overnight, but stay in faith and keep reminding him of what he promised. You day in and day out. Instead of complaining, say, Lord, you said. Instead of begging, say, Lord, you said. Instead of describing the circumstances, say, Abba, you said. If you get in the habit of praying his promises back to him, you will see Jesus at work in your life. His word and all his promises are yes. The only begotten son of God. There's one doctor that all the others rest upon. It is the rock bottom foundation of the Christian faith. Jesus of Nazareth is the only begotten son of God. Without this core belief, all the others are meaningless. Christianity stands upon the person of Jesus of Nazareth as the only begotten son from eternity past and into the future forever. He is unique because he is the only begotten son of God. The seven sayings are gathered from the four gospels. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus cries out. In Luke, he forgives his killers. He reassures the, per the pertinent or the penitent thief. I'm going to say it again. It's those seven words that he cried out from the cross. They are gathered from the four gospels. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus cries out to God. In Luke, he forgives his killers and he reassures the penitent thief and commends his spirit to the father. In John, he speaks to his mother, says he thirsts and declares the end of his earthly life. Jesus' last seven words from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Today shall thou be with me in paradise. Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. Yes, my Lord, my God, and my God. Why have thou forsaken me? Eli, Eli, Sabatini. He said, I thirst. He said, it is finished. And he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. But God released Jesus from the horrors of death 
and raised him back to life for death could not keep him in his grip. I'm going to say that again. Jesus released, God released Jesus from the horrors of death and raised him back to life for death could not keep him in his grip. That's in Acts 2 and 24. The resurrection amounts to the Father's clear signal that Jesus is a powerful son of God who has conquered death and reigns as Lord of all in Romans 1, 4 and 4, 25. The resurrection demonstrates that Jesus' blood of the new covenant saves his people from their sin. In other words, what the cross achieves, it achieves because Jesus rose again. It is an empty cross by which we are saved. Paul says that Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our purification. Let me say that again. In other words, what the cross achieves. It achieves because Jesus rose again. It is an empty cross by which we are saved. Paul says that Jesus was delivered over death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. He says that if Jesus had not been raised, we are still dead in our sins. So if Jesus didn't, ri didn't rise again, we are not saved. The cross only works because Jesus rose again from the dead. Believing that the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead is essential for Christians. Merely recognizing that he died for our sins is not enough. We must accept his resurrection in order to receive eternal life. Christ paid our debt, but his sacrifice on the cross means nothing. If life, if he possesses no power over the grave in van vanquishing evil and death, the Lord made our salvation possible. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of the Christian faith. Without the resurrection, the belief in God's saving grace, Jesus is destroyed. When Jesus rose from the dead, he confirmed his identity as what the son of God and his work of atonement and redemption, reconciliation and salvation. The resurrection was a literal physical raising of Jesus' body from the dead. Jesus was arrested. He was tried and found guilty of claiming to be a king. His body was hung on a cross between two thieves. After his death, Jesus' body was wrapped in linen cloth and placed in a tomb with a large stone rolled across the opening. On the third day and early morning, on an early Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and another Mary came to the tomb and found it empty. Sitting on the rolled away stone was an angel of the Lord who told them not to be afraid because Jesus had risen. As the women left to tell the disciples because they were hiding out, Jesus Christ met them and showed them his nail pierced hands. The Old and New Testament speak of the truth of Jesus being raised from death. Jesus testified of his resurrection before he died on the cross. And his disciples witnessed his body after the resurrection. Below are the Bible verses I'm going to give that both prophesy the resurrection of Jesus and testify the reality of the resurrected body of Christ. The Bible story of Jesus' crucifixion, the crucifixion of Jesus recorded in the New Testament books known as the Gospels, as I mentioned, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this Bible story is the central summary of the saving gospel of Jesus. As I had mentioned, Jesus had prophesied his death in Matthew. Through. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must what, go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders. Our New Testament resurrection scriptures, blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has accused, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1 and 3. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 14. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit and dwells in you. Romans eight eleven. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That was in John 11, 25, 26. I cannot go through all of these chapters that talked about Jesus' resurrection. However, I will list the chapters for you to read. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 23, 26, 49, and Luke 24, John 20, and Romans 6, 3, 13. And they're listed here as Geraldine is listing them. Today, Jesus lives. Today, Jesus reigns. He's the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And that's my message today. We should fall to our knees. We should fall to our knees to just think about 
that day that he was led to Calvary. Just think about it. he was innocent. And we see injustice every day. But today, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all my fears are gone. Because I know who holds the future. Because he lives. Today he lives. Others who may claim to be uh, living, they're dead. But Jesus rose. He rose again. And I'm wrapping up now. And I've already talked to you about giving and, and asked you to give. I'm not going to go over that again. Just say, will you join me in trusting the promise by giving to the ministry and worshiping God as faithful stewards to giving? Participate in the harvest that God has for us by sowing your gift to him today. The prayer of salvation, after all I've said, let me give this. Because someone may be here that don't even understand salvation and want to be a part of the family of Jesus Christ. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, Hebrews 13 and 5. We cannot earn salvation. We are saved by God's grace when we have faith in his son, Jesus Christ. All you must do is believe you are a sinner, that Christ died for your sins and ask his forgiveness. Then turn from your sins that is called repentance. Jesus Christ knows you and loves you. What matters to him is the attitude of your heart and your honesty. Christ invites us to come to him. And God has promised all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God in John 1 and 12. Romans 10 and 9 said, you said, Lord, in the Bible, that if we confess the Lord our God and believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. And right now you can say with me today, even if you haven't been spending time with him like you should. Right now, Lord, you say, I confess you as my Lord. With my heart, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. From this day forward, help me to live every day for you and in a way that pleases you. This very moment, I accept Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior. And according to his word, right now I am saved. God cannot and will not abandon you. The song said, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And life is worth the living just because he lives. So he lives today. He lives today. And we want to know in our hearts that Jesus reigns. He lives today. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because of his blood, I know it was the blood. And we say, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Yes, we sing those songs. And we will sing them in our heart. So I love each one of you. I thank you. I can't call every name because I don't see the names. But I want to bless you. And I want to tell you, I take this message to heart. Today we glorify and worship. We're so grateful, Lord. You died for our sins, but you rose again. And we shall meet you in, in eternity when you come. And so thank you. Thank you, each of you. And share the message with someone else today. Someone who, who needs to hear the word of God. And I'll be back on Wednesday. Uh, we'll be back next Saturday. I'll be back live next Saturday here. So I want to thank you again, bless you again with love and happiness. God loves you. I love you too. And we just got to, I'm just going to play a little of this song. Uh, you know what it is? Because why? <laughs> Lord, we need him all the time. We need him. We do need him. It's never a time or day that we don't need him. And so just going to play a little bit of this and just ask you just to <clears throat> pray for me as I continue to pray for you. As I continue to pray for you, I miss my family. I, I just love to come on here when you all are here. And thank you for those who gave feedback. Yes, the song say, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. And you're the, you're the one that guides my heart. And then we all say together, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So I'm going to get ready to sign off. I'm not looking at my time. Uh, so I don't know exactly what time it is. I hope I didn't go over and that I got through in time. But bless you again. Please share the message if you feel that it was a good message that you should share with someone. I will be praying for you. Be blessed. 
The song says, wherever you are, Lord, I am free. So thank you, one of you. Thank you, Geraldine. I love you. God bless each one of you. In Jesus' name, peace. Goodbye.